What's that sound? Good? We have uh, a sound system tonight. Thank you very much, Rich, um, to hopefully help everybody hear us a little bit better um, through our masks. So uh, we will see how that goes tonight. And uh, let's start with a roll call, please. Mike Blog? Here. Aaron Cavanaugh? Here. Carrie Choate? Here. Tom Coons? Here. Shelly Levin? Here. Let's stand for the pledge. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First on our agenda this evening is the consent calendar, um, which is comprised tonight of the minutes from our September 9th board meeting and our enrollment numbers. It was the pleasure of the board. I move that we accept them as uh, written. We have a motion from Mike, second from Carrie. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay, let's uh, move on to announcements and the superintendent's update. Thank you. Always a little intimidated when I use a microphone. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. Okay. Um, I, kind of, I have a couple of updates that I wanted to share tonight. First, I want to officially welcome Shelly uh, Levy to the board. Um, great to have you here. Um, I know there's always paperwork and everything that you fill in. Hopefully you, so you've got your iPad. You, hopefully you're all set. But if there's anything you need, um, please, please let us know. So we've continued to work through uh, the IT migrations. You, I think I talked about this in August and some of the challenges that we've had. As Rich knows, we keep breathing and we make a little bit of progress and then we take a step back and we make a little more progress. And I think we're, we're getting closer every day. Um, as Allison knows as well, um, you know, the SAU has provided some support uh, to her as we've migrated to power school. We have a consultant that works with the SAU uh, named Sue Johnson that has come down and, and helped out uh, just to you. Nothing with IT is simple, <laughs> so uh, and she's been really helpful, I think, in helping Allison. You know, as we have migrated again to the new uh, power school system, and you know, because all of that ties into the state reporting that we do every year, and this is the big week for state reporting. Like, everything is due, certified, and everything tomorrow. So again, I want to thank Allison for her efforts um, in that work because it's it's a lot of of work. Uh, but anyway, I wanted to mention, I know there's been some challenges with Blackboard Connect, and I know we've set up training for next week that uh, Richard and others will be participating in. So hopefully people can be a little more patient as we're trying to make sure that everyone's in the right place and they're getting the right calls and, and all of that. So again, thanks to Rich for continuing to problem solve and, and work through all of that. So one of the things, there's a couple things I wanted to mention that are on the agenda and we'll get into more detail about. Um, we have, I've included a policy on, um, on residency. And I was, it, this came up because I've worked through a few issues uh, with residency with Marshwood. And, you know, I said, well, usually what we do when there's like conflict or, or questions or anything, I go back to look at what the board policy is. Well, there wasn't one. So that's why that's included too. That's a new policy. It's been on the books for a long time, reflective of the law. Oh, we can talk a little bit more about that. But I think it will help add some clarity in the conversations, particularly when we have students that move to Rollinsford that did not go through RGS. That's when we start to, it, it gets a little challenging sometimes about you know, what information they need to provide and who verifies all that. So hopefully this language will help help to navigate some of those, those challenges that we've had. I'm also looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have in a bit about uh, the capital improvement plan 
and looking forward to, you know, whether what we can possibly do to continue to upgrade the facility and using the federal funds. Uh, we do need to submit that use of funds plan, so I'm looking forward to the conversation about that. And then I know Rich is going to do some more particular updates around COVID, but I just want to thank the staff, the students, and the families for adhering to the established protocols. I know this is not easy. Um, some of you, I think, received an email from, uh, from Marshwood today talking about Sanford and how they went back, their career tech center went back to remote learning today and tomorrow. Uh, it's, it's, it's out there and we're hearing about it all over the place. And the fact that we're able to stay in and keep things going here uh, with little disruption, I think is, is a testament to everybody. So I, again, I know it's not easy. I, you know, I look at Gail because I know she deals with a lot of folks and it's not always, it, there's challenges with that. But again, you know, I just want to thank everyone for, uh, for their efforts. That's my report. Thank you, Lori. Next, we have our principal's report. Uh, I'll touch on some of the items in my report in the packet, but uh, I don't know if sitting in front, it'll probably get feedback. Can you all hear? I can okay? hear. Okay. I'll try to keep speaking up. Um, yeah, one of the things that I don't think any of us anticipated to piggyback off of Lori is the, um, the technology pieces with the transition. The transition with SA 104 for our building has been seamless. Um, you know, the new administration has been very supportive. I've been over a couple of times to meet with them. Met last week to start our budget discussions. Um, so those types of transitions are very easy and uh, going well. It's just been a nightmare with the technology. Um, fortunately, we can communicate with families now, but the system is different, the alert system is. Um, so emergency calls that go out to all of our um, families um, and all of the addresses and phone numbers, I haven't quite figured that piece out yet because we haven't had the training. Um, there are people that are in the system that no longer go to school here or no longer work here. Um, tried removing them, but then they reappear. So just some different things going on. That's one example. And you know, Alex and Brian do examples with Power School. You know, Gail is working on um, our SNAP healthcare system. Um, it'll all get there. It's just you know that's been the piece that I don't think any of us anticipated um, with this transition. Um, so. For those that are not getting alerts, um, I apologize. Hopefully by the end of next week we'll have it all figured out. And I'll know what I'm doing a little bit better than what I have been. Um, in my report, uh, I just want to talk about a couple of things. We, um, the kids, uh, I think, I've got a parent newsletter going out tomorrow. One of the things that I mentioned is early in the year there was um, student fatigue. Um, because a six and a half hour day is tough after a year and a half of, you know, three to four hour days. Um, most of our kids were done formal lessons around noontime. Um, some had maybe one lesson in the afternoon. Some may have had independent work in the afternoon during remote learning. So that early year fatigue was there. We could tell the stamina for um, you know, participating in formal school was tough, but um, it didn't take long. You know, the kids are doing great. Um, I go into the uh, classrooms 2.30, quarter three in the afternoon, and, you know, teachers are still, you know, getting in those last few lessons before the bell rings. Um, and the kids are um, doing much better now that we're into a routine, and um, they've figured out that, you know, they've got those afternoon classes this year. Um, something that we didn't predict, but it was very, um, it, you could tell early in the year that it was tough for kids to sustain that long. Um, we've had some excursions outside of the school. We started our walking field trips back to the library again. Um, the town library reached out. They were great about saying they would reserve the time just for us. Um, so we've got five classrooms participating in a monthly walk. Uh, it gives kids a chance 
chance to see what's available in the community, sign up books, um, and hopefully you know, make that a family uh, event uh, throughout the month. Uh, we have had one field trip off of campus. Um, our fourth grade class went to the Brown Center, which is an all outdoor field trip. It's a team building cooperative um, that they've done for a number of years. Uh, the kids uh, followed school protocols while there. Uh, the Brown Center um, follows the protocols that the school has that shows up. Um, so if it's a school with no mask mandate, then you know, masks are optional for kids there. But we had a mask mandate, so our kids were expected to wear the mask while they were there to stay safe. Um, but other than that, it, the indoor field trips were sort of saying no right now. Um, there's just too much going on, and we don't want um, our kids going out and possibly being exposed to members of the public um, on a school activity. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm teaming with the PTO for their first fundraiser of the year. Uh, we're doing a fun run. They had started to set this up prior to the pandemic with Mr. Franks, and um, other schools locally have done it and have raised a lot of money. So uh, we connected this summer, uh, the PTO and I did, about um, getting this rolling this fall before the snow flies. Uh, kids uh, raise money, they get donations, either a flat donation or a donation on how many laps they complete. Um, so I set up a two-tenths of a mile course around our fields that we're going to do in a couple weeks during the day classes. Um, kids will get information tomorrow in their class for me, and then I've got an alert ready to go out to families with the information so that any families who are interested in having their kids fundraise can um, register them. It's an online program that they um, you know, register their child. We don't register any of the kids. Uh, it's uh, parent permission only. Uh, if they choose to raise funds, that's great. If they choose not to, they still get to participate because it's a regular phys ed class. Uh, it works well for me because uh, we're doing physical fitness over the next two to three lessons. Uh, so this will be our endurance lesson where kids get to choose whether they run, they jog, uh, speed walk, or just take a walk away walk. Uh, but we're going to try to work on uh, endurance during that lesson. Should be a fun day. And then the last piece that I just want to talk about are some of the health updates. Um, I'm sure Gail will chime in at the end of the uh, meeting if I miss anything, but um, this year has been, I think, as challenging, if not more challenging in some ways, uh, because we have all of the kids every day. Whereas most of last year was either remote or we'd have two or three classrooms at a time. Um, so the management piece has been just as challenging this year. Um, we've had a little bit of a struggle um, when staff have had to be out with symptoms um, or for other reasons. Um, we do have probably six consistent subs, um, but they're not always available every day. Um, so we've had a couple of days where we've had to cover within or you know, not fill a role because um, we just don't have the personnel. But overall, we're one of the lucky schools in New Hampshire where fully staffed, other than a part-time custodian. Um, if you go on any of the uh, educator websites, schools are listing you know, tons of positions that are open right now, so we are extremely fortunate. Uh, we've got staff and student flu shock clinics set up for next week. Staff will be on uh, next Tuesday, students next Friday. Um, any parent who wishes their child to have a flu shot here at school can um, register their child. We sent that information home, I think, last week. Um, and we're still accepting registrations right up until the day, I believe. Uh, there's a lot of students and staff with fall cold symptoms. And we knew this was going to happen. Um, and, and it's challenging to um, explain to families that, you know, if these are symptoms that mirror COVID symptoms, then they need to go home and we recommend that you get them tested so that if it's not COVID, they can come back as soon as they feel better. Um, 
family's been great, uh, reaching out to Gail, mostly Gail this year, last year it was a combination of both of us, but um, most people are reaching directly out to her about you know, questions that they might have, um, what type of test should they get, where's the best locations to get tests. Um, so it, for the most part, it's gone very well. It's just keeping up with it. You know, Gail does a nice job of keeping her list of who's out and who's returned negative tests. And, um, hopefully that type of situation continues because we've only had uh, two positive cases since the beginning of the year that we're aware of. Um, and then the last thing in the packet that I included was the reopening plan. And I just want to pull up the page. There, we needed to clarify something. Um, on page 14, we had a section called exemption from quarantine. Um, but most of the language in that section dealt with um, travel situations. Um, so after people were vaccinated um, and 14 days beyond vaccination, then they didn't need to quarantine um, from travel. But we didn't have anything um, about close household contacts. So what we added is directly from the language um, that we get from the state and from the CDC. Um, and it's just you know, a couple of sentences that say close household contacts of someone diagnosed with COVID-19 are not required to quarantine if they are fully vaccinated. However, in accordance with the guidance from the CDC, for people who are fully vaccinated, those people are recommended to get tested three to five days following their exposure, wear a face mask in indoor public settings for 14 days. Um, or at least until they receive a negative test result. Um, so we have had a couple of those situations because we've had some positive cases. Um, maybe not positive cases in our building, but positive cases um, in families outside of our building. Um, so if um, their children, obviously they're not vaccinated, if they've had contact, then unfortunately they still have to quarantine. Uh, if it's a staff member uh, that is uh, vaccinated, then they don't necessarily have to quarantine um, as long as a negative test comes back. So that's basically what that language says. It allows the flexibility for vaccinated folks to continue to come to school. That's everything I have for my report. I know the board has um, readopted the plan every time we've made changes. I don't know if you want to continue that pattern or... Uh, does anyone have any questions or comments about that change that Rich is talking about here on page 14? Can you hear me? Oh, this is fun. <laughs> Uh, yeah, my question, uh, when I look at that paragraph, I think it's good, uh, just one thing, you know, it says, uh, someone di diagnosed with COVID-19 are not required to quarantine if they are fully vaccinated. It doesn't say anything about remaining asymptomatic in that paragraph. So is that just implied, or can we add asymptomatic? Because if they're fully vaccinated, they start to have symptoms, they still need to quarantine. Correct. In a different section of the reopening plan, anyone with symptoms, vaccinated or unvaccinated, is required to stay at home or uh, provide a negative test. So this specific language, I, I understand what you're saying, Mike. Um, there's other language in our reopening plan that addresses that. Okay, I guess, I mean, is it easy enough just to put that in there that says as long as they remain asymptomatic? Because a lot of times what you see is people re read the paragraph that they think applies to them and they don't, you know, read the rest of the document. True. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how everybody else feels, but I think it's as easy as just putting that wording in there. Yeah. That's my take. I don't like this microphone thing. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't think it would hurt to put that in there and just be a little redundant against other sections, but just like you said, people can get all the information at once. Any, any other questions or comments? I mean, I don't love it personally. I know we've been here before when we discussed it at the beginning, I think. That if you're in close contact, especially continuously, if you're living in the same household as someone who has COVID-19, that you should quarantine. But um, I understand that these are the CDC guidelines and that it hasn't caused an issue in the past and that there could potentially be staffing issues if everybody has to quarantine. Write a note. <laughs> you can speak now. So you don't just do nothing then. If you don't quarantine, you have to self-absorb. That's self-observe. So you definitely have to check yourself every day. Mm -hmm. Still masking. It's like a light quarantine. So it's not like you just went, oh, I don't have to because I can't see it. You still really have to watch yourself. I would imagine, Gail, that people are reaching out to you with these types of questions and you're able to give them. I have that. references, I, I email them, right, right. From, from NHGHHS, what self-observing means to do, what quarantine means to do, travel guidance, when people are traveling, this is what you need to do, yeah, always emailing them. And it does sound like the community has been really great about this, so Thank I appreciate that. Thank you for Absolutely so on. much. It's, it's fatiguing beyond what we ever expected. Good okay. Really good. Thank you for that clarification. Um, I had one other question, Rich, for you on the very beginning of the reopening plan under phase four, so that's page three, it's still talking about remote instruction and remote learning. And I thought we had agreed to strike that. Just a side note, um, but I think we can vote now to accept the amended plan unless there are any further questions or discussion. Do you want me to reread that phrase that Mike recommended? Sure. So it's the initial sentence in that blue section, uh, not required to quarantine if they are fully vaccinated as long as they remain asymptomatic. Is that part of it from your perspective? Yeah, I motion that we accept the, the plan with the uh, changes. Second. Is there a second? <laughs> yeah, it's in our packet, which you should have. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. You didn't get it. I only got some minutes and the agenda. It's in the same. It's in the same file with the minutes. You just have to scroll all the way down. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Thank you. Thank you, Rich, for your report. And it's great to hear that things are going well. I understand it's extremely challenging. No, and we definitely appreciate all your hard work. And Gail, your hard work just on an ongoing basis. Um, I really hope that, you know, as 
they're promising that tests will be more readily available and hopefully vaccines for younger kids come along. Hopefully that will um, make some of that a little bit easier. Um, and at the same time, it's great to hear that the kids are doing these outdoor field trips and you know getting back into their routines and their activities and enjoying it. It's just just fantastic to hear. So thank you very much. Uh, Rich, I do have one question for you. Uh, when you mentioned the part-time custodian, I know we've been talking about that for quite some time. How long has that been been vacant? Since it was placed in the budget a year and a half ago. So we, we've never filled it since it's been placed in there? We've had a couple of applicants um, that just weren't right for the position, uh, and it's been consistently advertised the entire time and still we haven't been able to find anybody. We're similar to a lot of other businesses in that respect. It's a part time position, no benefits, so it's gonna to be tough to fill. Is it does it affect the operation of the school at all or do you see a, a down downside to it right now? The focus we've had on school days is clean, you know, making sure that it's a clean building for the next morning. Um, so our full-time custodian isn't able to do some of those extra things that normally a 20-hour a week person would do. In addition, our facilities director does all of the lawn care, all of the outside stuff, which is part of his responsibility, but at certain times of year when it's prevalent, it chews up a lot of his time where he could be working on other types of projects. So it would be great to have the 20 hour, it would take the pressure off the two of them and you know, some of the little things that you know, get put off for a little while to start getting done, but you know, the important stuff is getting done. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything that we as a board can do to help you out or just keep reposting it and we'll see if, how it goes? If you know a hard worker who's interested in 20 hours a week that would work well at RGS, we'd love to be. Thanks, Rich. Have we advertised it on any of the sort of non-educational job boards? The SAU. That might be. Because sure. I haven't seen it. Um, at jobs and schools, that's why we usually advertise everything. I mean, we could try to look at it in the Fosters, maybe? Yeah, I, I wouldn't say Fosters, um, but maybe Indeed or um, Monster. I know we need it. You know, we need a specific type of person to be able to work in the school, so it makes sense to advertise on the school boards. But um, if you're not having any luck, sometimes by widening the the reach a little bit, you yeah, might reach some other people. Um, you know, who are looking for some part time hours. Great, now we're up to the exciting capital improvement plan draft. I think Lori and I are going to actually do 5.1 and 5.2 together at some point. I'll start with the CIP and then we'll move into the 5.2 because okay. they're very related, so I'm going to do it. Can everybody hear me if I don't use the microphone? Yes. Yes? <laughs> Just because I like to sh talk with my hands and shuffle the paper and stuff. So. <laughs> All right, so to start with the CIP last month, uh, Lori, Rich, Chuck, and myself um, completed a walkthrough of the building um, just to look over the different projects and go over the CIP that we created in 2019 to do some updates. So we, we walked the building and discussed the projects and we came up with a few um, next steps. So we wanted to contact Amy Clark. She's um, with the Department of Education. She handles all the building aid and the federal funds for uh, building projects um, so that she could come and tour the facility. We also wanted to contact Mike Davey from EEI. He's the one that did the proposal last, I mean, this time last year um, for the HVAC and the upgrades for the building. Um, we also wanted to contact Peter Mishu to discuss the, the building which was on the historical registry and determine what projects we could do to the building and different, you know, and how that affected the historical registry. 
Um, we talked about the um, annex bathrooms and building those into the FY23 budget, doing the repairs to these bathrooms down here, um, replacing the fixtures, replacing the stalls, and doing an upgrade to the, the bathrooms there. Um, the secure entrance was on the CIP. We wanted to remove that because that part has been, that project has been completed. And then we discussed adding the projects that EEI did identify in uh, their proposal for the HVAC, the boilers, and ventilation, and all of that. And then Rich uh, took us outside of the side ramp at the, at the end of the building. There's some repairs that need to be done there. So we put in the packet a revised list of the CIP. We didn't add any costs to this um, list yet. We are still trying to gather those costs and figure out where we can place them and which years we want to place them in. But we wanted to give you an idea of the projects that we were anticipating. So again, on this list, we added a boiler replacement the air ventilation system, the DVC controls that go along with that system, added insulation and new ceilings, uh, the window replacement in the gym in the main building, uh, the roof replacement of the main building, uh, like I said, the annex bathroom renovations and the repairs to the ramp uh, on the side entrance. So those are the projects that we're considering for the CIP. Uh, we did contact Amy Clark and she did come to the building on September 27th. Uh, Rich, myself, and Chuck toured with her. We showed her uh, boilers, um, we took her around the whole building. She had never been here before, so she was really excited to see the building. Um, she went over with us the, you know, the process of building it and how competitive it is, and we went through it and received funds in Summersworth for the Maplewood project. It's a very competitive pro pro process. The funds are so limited, they don't fund a lot of projects. Right now, she said all her funding for next year is, is, is spoken for at this point. Um, so we're gonna have to have further discussions on whether or not a small project like we would do here would even qualify to even, you know, it is so much involved in, in applying for the funds. She wasn't sure that the size of this project would really be worth applying for. So we have to have further discussions on that. So that's why I want to see the So So related to that, you know, some of the things that you've talked about in the past as a board were, are related to the CIP items, but also how do you utilize federal funds? Uh, as you know, uh, we and we talked about this last time, KB's provided you a list, kind of an update on, you know, here's what you've received so far for you know, the CARES Act, ESSER 2, ESSER 3. Uh, so we wanted to put that in, you know, put that in front of you again and say, are there some things in, on the CIP that might qualify for ESSER funds that might help you to be able to fund some of these projects? But that's not your only funding source. There are other options, whether that's, um, you know, warrant articles, that's building it into your budget. There are, you have a, a capital reserve account. There are other grant opportunities we've we've received a couple over the the last uh, week or so that could possibly help um, you know with with moving some things forward so rich when when rich and katie and i met to talk about the budget we brainstormed looked at the cip list and then looked at esser funds and some of the other opportunities and that's what i put in the, the memo that i prepared for you and Again, as I put on here, this is really a discussion up. You know, it's a place to start the discussion. It's, it's not, this is what we're saying you should do. This is not, you know, it's nothing more than that. So I don't want people to understand, like, this is, this is what we're doing. I will say to you, though, that I did receive a notice from the Department of Ed saying you have not submitted your ESSER plan, uh, your ESSER 3 use of funds plan. And we were gonna talk about, we talked about it briefly at your last meeting, but I do need to put in something. Um, that's a requirement to be able to utilize the funds and it's a requirement that the state have all districts submit these plans. So I, I'm going to need to move this forward um, sooner than later. So in the memo that I prepared for you, you know, as we've talked about before, but just as a recap, um, your SR3 funding is um, just under $157,000. Um, those funds can be used for a number of different things. Um, there's a 20% set aside for um, the academic impact of lost instructional time. And you have used, um, you know, 
those funds for you know literacy support you know you can use summer school there's a lot of different things that you can use those for among many other things and then you also can use them for the what we, the first bullet there the continuous uh, and safe operation of in-person learning so that's when we start talking about ventilation it's not going to pay for your boilers but it could pay for, it certainly would help pay for your the ventilation that you've talked about last year However, you don't have enough. <laughs> Unfortunately, as Katie said, we were really hoping that, um, that the building aid opportunity would be able to fill in some of the gap. And as she described, it is a competitive process. There's a, there's a rating scale of projects. Um, unfortunately, we had some things happen in Summersworth that day, so I was not able to come down and join uh, the conversation that day. But, um, and having gone through the process before, it is there's a lot to it. And again, that's our job, and we will certainly support going forward with, with an application, but just know that there's it, it may not come to fruition. So we just wanted to be upfront about that. So when Rich and Katie and I met, we started looking like how could we at least start the conversation to move things forward. So if you look at the second page of the memo that I prepared for you, we present two options, uh, three options I should say. And again, nothing here is, is set in stone. There's nothing here again, just for discussion purposes. So the first option that we, that we thought, okay, looking at that list of CIP items, that you could use ESSER funds, capital reserve, you know, possibly a warrant um, article and or putting these aside in your in your budget to, to replace the in, the entire project that you talked with EEI about last year. Um, and again, you would have to bid that out. There's an RP process. It's not just I call up Mike Davey and say, hey, we're ready. It's it, There's a, a whole list of things that you need to do to be uh, to prepare for that, and that takes months. So we are going to be looking sooner than later if you want to move something forward uh, to be able to um, have the go-ahead so we can get the, the work done that needs to be done um, in preparation for the votes that will be coming up. Um, again, it's not going to pay for everything that you need to do. Um, but you also can use the funds to support the learning loss pieces. And, and again, we've talked about some of that before. Option two is uh, kind of taking things in a little bit different direction. In, in our conversations, what, even though if we know ventilation is a, is a concern, one of the other concerns that rises right up to the top of the list is the boiler plant. And I know that's something that, that you all have talked about before, concern about the age and you know, we, we, it's one of those things that it's great while it's working and when it's not, then then it doesn't. And then the, as you know, as things get older, like a car, you know, the parts get harder to replace, it's harder to find them. And, you know, it may last for another five years, 10 years, or five days. It, you just don't know. And I, you know, I don't try to be alarmed, but you just don't know, especially as things get older. So one thing we thought about was, well, you have a sizable amount in your capital reserve account that perhaps maybe that's a project that, that you, you could consider moving forward with. Um, you know, again, that's, again, Katie can talk about some of the detail around moving that forward as a Warren article to secure some of those funds. And then again, you could continue with the learning loss pieces again knowing you have to have that 20% set aside in, um, in ESSER. But you can use more than 20%. So when you see the, in, you know, 2B, when I have ESSER 3, it's, you know, just under $71,000, that's, that's fine. You can use those ESSER funds for what you would do, you know, what your need is. You don't just have to use the 20%. And then the other option, we said, well, maybe we, it's not the time to do any kind of capital improvements, and maybe you want to put um, those uh, resources into more learning loss type activities. And that could be a number of different things. So again, just a place to kind of start the conversation um, you know, around using the ESSER funds in some form or fashion, um, and also to try to navigate through some possible movement on, on you know, capital improvement projects. So hopefully this helps and it, and it makes some sense. It took us a long time to talk it through. It, it's hard when you try to combine a lot of things sometimes and, and try to sort it through, but 
hopefully this it helps. So uh, do you want to add anything else? Or? No, we just talked earlier about maybe at your next meeting in November as we start our budget discussions that maybe we can start trying to figure out if there's an option that we want to go with um, because like Lori said, it is a process to get some of these things in line to get the RFPs out and get the quotes if you wanted to move forward with some of these projects. So I think probably by your November meeting we should go in some sort of direction, whatever that may be. It could be one of these or it could be something completely different because we did talk maybe it's a combination of you know, could it be. could be anything. You know, I don't want people to have sticker shock from the numbers. That, that's no, no, the no, thing. Yeah, this doesn't but have to be a decision tonight. Correct. Right. So I thank you so much for for doing this work and for putting this together because this really it's a difficult decision, but these options I think are really, you know, what we should be looking at um, and and debating about. And um, this is a good way to sort of understand what funding can be used for what types of projects. Um, I will say that um, I know the boilers are really urgent. Um, they've, they've come to their end of life um, years ago. I know um, Dick helped us limp along with them for several years, um, but you know, based on at least what I've heard, um, we are sort of playing with fire in terms of the boilers. So from my perspective, I think that is something we should be sure to consider doing for this upcoming um, budget season. And um, we do have a sizable amount in our capital reserve, which we've been building up for, you know, for that purpose. Um, and then, you know, using the SR2 funds for learning loss and other um, other opportunities, maybe a, an outdoor classroom or something like that is something that we could consider. Um, and those are good until 2024, so like you did this summer with your summer program, you could do that again for the next two summers yeah. too, as well, you know, do the boost program like you did here again, if you did that option. One thing too, when you mentioned the capital reserve fund too, if you remember correctly, it was either our deliberative session or public hearing, I can't remember which, a, a, a community member got up and asked the question of why we have so much money in there, why do we keep putting money in there, what are we using it for? So it might be a good year to consider using it where people are wondering what, we, what we're planning for. Yeah, you know? for sure. Um, and then, you know, the, the elephant in the room is the, the ventilation system, which is just so much money, and we've gone back and forth several times on that. Um, so, th those are my thoughts. What I, I know, we don't need, need to necessarily make a decision tonight. Um, I think it's a good idea to discuss it at our at our budget meeting next month. But what what comments or questions do you guys have? talked about solar in regards to doing the whole thing, so we had sort of a presentation about the whole HVAC system, ventilation, boilers, everything at once, and solar was part of that discussion, but I don't think that we looked at it only in regards to boilers or as a separate project. And was it cost prohibitive, or was it equal, or I don't remember. I think it was a lot of times with solar, you they want to give you a presentation where you can at least break even, and I think we weren't quite breaking even with it. Um, but I I may not be remembering that correctly. I'd have to go back and look at it. Um, but that's certainly something that we could add to our RFP to get bids. Um, Yeah, I mean, we can we can definitely look into that.
Now you know when they have a question, they just pick up the microphone. Uh, Katie, you might know this one. Were the boilers part of the EEI presentation? So that one point, whatever? They were, yeah. Um, yes, they were. Okay, so that is rolled underneath that as well. Yeah, so the 1.168 that Lori references in option one, that's what the, is that what the boiler was for? Or is that just the HP? Oh, that's the energy. No, that was everything. Yeah. So that was everything. That includes solar controls for the solar HP. Solar was a piece of that. It included the PDC controls, the propane boiler, removing the oil tank, ventilation, attic insulation, and new ceiling. Okay, thank you. I do have a question for either Katie or Lori. Um, so if we did move forward with say, just option one, just hypothetically speaking, and we went through the, all the, the process of, you know, putting it on the warrant and, you know, we get a, a loan that covers 10 years or whatever, you know, so it's split up. And then we do submit an application to the state. Is there, is, could that act retroactively or does that have to be done before we put the warrant out there? Start the project. Once the project started, you can't get building aid back for it. So if, if I know that we ran into that in summer's work, we had to wait to start the May 4th project until we knew for sure we were getting building aid. Otherwise, you wouldn't get it because you've already started the project. So I don't know if that answered your question. I mean, there's no money for next year for building aid. So if you'd be looking at waiting at least the next round when they do the budget again. And there's no guarantee that money will be placed into the budget for building aid. Yeah, so if next year's money is already, already spoken for, so yeah. we'd have to, the following fiscal year, we'd need money. But ESSER funds go through there, so we, we'd still be covered with the ESSER funds. Yeah. So, when, so when January 1st of this year is you have to put an intent in if you're applying for building aid. Then July 1st, I believe, is your application is due for the following year. Got it. So it would be next year's budget season that we'd work on that if, if we were to elect to go that route? Yes. Like I said, you, you wouldn't be able to start any of the project because then you can't get building aid if you've already started. Okay. Thank you. So, so in a bigger district like Summer's work, do you put in um, you know, requests every January 1st for building aid? No. This was the first time we have done it since, when, well, Heidelberg's was the last time we got it. Um, so, yes, no, we don't. No, but do you think there's schools or districts that always put it in in the hopes of getting it and then they'll get lucky? Or, because it doesn't sound like there's a lot of money available. There's not a lot of money available. Well, there's also, there's also a lot of need, yeah. <laughs> to be quite honest with you. I mean, there's a lot of aging schools. The building aid had a, what, 10 or 12 year moratorium. So they didn't fund any projects. The state didn't for a long time. And so now they're playing catch up. Um, I, you know, the concern, even though, you know, a million, two million dollars looks like a lot of money, it, it is, but it also, in the scheme of the projects that they're looking at, like again, the one that we did in, in uh, Summersworth, it's about a four million dollar project. And we had to, I don't want to say just add things to, you know, to complete, but we needed to have a, a substantial project. I'm not sure. And again, I don't know if Amy spoke any differently about whether this would be substantial enough to, you know, to make, you know, the, the cut in the, because there's this whole rating system that you have to go through, so. Um, and one thing she described to us when she was here, so say there were five projects that got funded in the current year, and three of the projects went forward with their warrant articles and they got approved, but the other two failed for whatever reason. She said those may, might get carried over yes. into the next budget cycle, so you've already got two projects already in there for the next time somebody else applies. So you may, even if we apply, there could be other projects already ahead of us because their warrant articles failed and then they get pushed into So they don't distribute the money that the towns were rejected. No. They, they hold that money and take it to next year. Yes. And maybe give it to that town or not. Right. And then it's a waiting system, like Lori said, once all the projects are in, you get placed on a waiting system and they, they might only take two projects. If 
one project is for the whole amount that's in the budget for building aid, then that's the only project that's going to get funded that year. So it does sound like if you, if you submit something every year, you might get lucky. I would encourage everyone to play Kino because that's how they're funding building aid right now. So just a little plug yeah. for Kino. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. I mean, if we can certainly put, we could put in our intent, I think, for January 1st so that at least the intent is in there. And then if we don't decide not to put the full application in in July, then we could, I think, do that. You, you certainly could. I, I will say, though, we, we would definitely want to look for a committee, because I think you would need, I don't know if she talked about, you know, the, the, the support from the town yeah. coming in the war, you know, the yeah. commitment, so that if you if you receive the funding, I mean, it's one of the challenges with this process is trying to align town voting processes with the state's approval. A lot of times they're happening at the same time. And it's, and it's a challenge for communities that, uh, that, that know that they need to have the vote to be able to move things forward. I dealt with that in my prior school district. And, and, and it's, it's very, very challenging. Um, I so, think that helps us on the Summers Road side, too, because it's a city form of government right. versus a town, so that it was able to move through that process much, much faster. Quicker. So, so I'm not, I don't want to discourage you from, from considering building aid. But I just want we just wanted to be realistic that it may not be the the, the the thing we were hoping that might be able to put the funding forward. So that's where we thought, well, as we talked it through, looking again at option two, boils are really the concern if we can move that piece forward and that takes away from the buildup of funds that you have in the capital reserve. But maybe that's the place to start for now. Rebuild that capital reserve. Um, but I don't know. I mean, it's just it's it's tough because it's just there's just not enough money in any one place to, to make this happen. We did though, as Mark Lori mentioned, receive two mm -hmm. grant opportunities this week too. There was a seed grant. I think it was up to eighty thousand. You have to do a twenty percent match. We could apply for that. I'm getting clarification on the timeline though because I think it, the project would have to be completed by the end of this year. Is what it looked like to me. But it may be something we could apply. I don't know if they do it every year. And then Amy Clark did give us um, the USDA offers grants or leases for these types of projects. So we're looking into that one as well. It sounds like we need to prioritize the boilers when it comes to our capital reserve fund, but that still leaves us with what meeting process is that for SR2, right? So is there like a deadline that we need to submit our plan to? Uh, they want it at the end of August, so, uh, you know, they, they've come to learn that we'll, we'll get, I mean, and, and again, I, I want, they have a time frame and I, that I completely respect, but I also respect the timeline that you all have and the, the conversations that you need to have. So, I mean, so, and we know that from what our experience has been with, with these plans is that they're fluid. So, we could put in something that says, at this point, we're going to commit the funds to the learning loss pieces, and we can identify some of that. And then if you make a different decision, then you can, you can adjust that. Again, you have to have that 20% set aside. But what I didn't want to, and, and we've had conversation about it, but I think we definitely, there's a, there's a large piece of, you know, of the input from the community, and of course, that's your, you represent the community. So we wanted to have the conversation with you. Uh, as a board, um, I didn't feel like it was Rich's responsibility or mine also solely to, to put this in on your behalf. So we wanted to have the conversation. And you remember last month was a tough month, so we really didn't want to get into the, the details of, the, of this. So here we are in, in October. But I, it would be great to get it submitted in the next week or so. Well, to Mike's point, too, um, the SR3 funds can go into 2024. So, you know, if we ended up with option two to address the boilers and then planned to still use some of the ESSER three funds in the next year or two to try to get the other HVAC items taken care of, then that maybe gives us more time to, to apply for some of these other funding sources and grants. Um, this, I think the SEEDS funds are, they have been available for them. I mean, it's an annual yeah. thing, but it's only one school in New Hampshire. 
sure. Which is, again, it's crazy. And again, like you said, you just keep putting in and hope that your turn yeah. comes up. Um, you know, and again, I'm not familiar with the USDA. Yeah. We just received that information a couple days ago. So. Um, it's Grant and Lisa, I think they all are. Yeah, I, I for one would be in favor of, you know, generically saying we're going to put some money towards the learning loss, but also we're going to put money towards the HVAC system. Because, I mean, we've got to get EEI back in here before we can make, you know, we have people that weren't part of that conversation. So we, we really kind of need them to, to come in and help to educate some of the new board members and, and see where we're at. Because, I mean, yeah, the boilers are definitely a priority, but the whole HVAC system is also, you know, that... We pushed it off last year, but we were pretty close last year to, to, to putting that in. So I, I would say we can generically put something forward that says SR3 going towards HVAC, SR2 to learning loss initially, and then you know, we can adjust that as we go. But I would, I don't know, I would suggest that maybe we get EEI back here in November if that's the way we want to go. EEI is the company that did all the, uh, the, the work up for the HVAC system and everything. And they, they presented us with options and how we could actually you know, get funding as well and how we could present it to the town. Like consulting firm? Yeah, they do a, how would you describe them? I mean, They're an energy services company. So they, they do consulting but they all, and planning so they can, and I think that's part of what they did before was they came in and looked at, and created a plan at least a tentative plan for you, um, identifying what your needs, potential needs were. And then um, they, if you selected them, we would have to go through to be able to use the federal funds, because we did had to do this in summers where if you go through an RFP process, so they would bid on being your energy company, and then you would work with them to execute the projects. So they actually do the construction, um, the installation, if you will, on the ventilation project. So, so they're they're kind of all in one, uh, which is nice. And then they sub out, obviously, with electrical and things all on that line. But, um, but yeah, that's that's them. But we certainly, I'm sure, I talked with Mike Davy a couple of days ago, and I know there's, they certainly would be very interested in coming back and having a conversation with you just to inform you. I mean, obviously, they'd love to be selected as your vendor, but. But this is also something that, you know, that's near and dear to them, and that's part of the service that they provide, is just helping to educate um, as well about what your options are. Uh, the other thing we haven't really talked about is leasing. You know, there's a performance lease option as well. Um, and so that might be something that you would explore as well, to lease part of this. And you, you know, if you look at the quote that, that Mike gave you last year, there's potential savings. And so they look at, that's what performance contracting is. They look at if your performance is stronger, it's going to reduce your energy costs. And that the idea is, depending on the type of project that you have, that you come almost not cost neutral. We had one of those projects. Was that at Maplewood, I think? Um, where the, the ventilation system, because of the rebates and the energy savings, was, was cost neutral. So, you know, Katie took all those expenses from the energy line and put them over to the lease. So it, it, it's, it's, it can be an option, but then you're committed to, like, you know, I think that term is 15 years. So that comes with decisions that have to be made as well. So, so there's all sorts of options. I mean, the, the, nice, the, the best option would be free money that you can just you know, pay for all these things, and then you, then you can go and you don't have those longer term commitments. But, that, but the performance leasing is also another option. And Mike could just kind of lay out all of that for you if that's what you want. And you have different options too, like year one you could do just this and that. Yeah, year two you could do this piece of the project. We didn't want to do it all in one year as well. Yeah, ours unfortunately didn't have that cost neutral no, um, bottom line because our we've already made so many um, upgrades to efficiency and things. So unfortunately, it wasn't there was some savings on energy, but it wasn't canceling anything out by any means. So. Yeah, Yes, from like EverSource or you yeah. can tell the utility companies that we agree with. Is there a included in the total? It is. Again, we have to go out to RFP as well. 
requirement for the federal funds, we would have to, you know, and it's such a large dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? I would like to be able to submit to the state the use of funds. And so if, if you're fine with me, and I can get, I can work with Rich and Katie around adding more detail. Sorry, I forgot. <laughs> adding more detail as far as. We've got to work on our, get on our game here, Aaron. <laughs> um, that we can work on, you know, adding a little detail to, to that. Um, and, you know, again, if it's going to focus on summer. Or, and again, it can it can change because your needs. You may find, you know, as Rich was describing before. I mean, your kids are, are get still getting used to a, a regular school day. So maybe there's some other things that you want to do. Um, you know, and I don't know what those things might be. That would be the conversation with him. But but if I can move that forward, that would that would be great. And then the state's happy. We we made made that commitment, and then can move forward. So we'll work together, and again, I'll I'll provide you a copy of the plan in your next packet, um, so you can see. It, but it will be focused on the learning loss mm -hmm. pieces, and we can certainly add. You know, our intent is to utilize these funds for the safe operation of schools, and looking at an HVAC project. And again, doesn't commit you to anything says this is on our radar if that's okay and then if you if you would like I can certainly ask Mike Davey if, to come back and ask him to present to you again you know just a little bit more about kind of a general overview of performance contracting and, and some pieces that he's seen in the building um, and then you can you have a little more information about um, about where things are at because even though I don't think the scope of what you have here has changed but he can talk to you about changes that oh, that COVID has you know availability of equipment and when a project could happen and you know just some of the cost increases that you would, might incur so it's you know I think it might it would be helpful to give you know to help you uh, with that information. He also works closely with Amy Clark, too, from the state, right. so he might have more insight on other projects that are in the building AQ as well, so he might be able to give us more information on that as well. Yeah, I think that would be very helpful to have him come back, um, you know, as to help all of us, especially some of our newer members who didn't mm -hmm. see the original presentation and um, help us kind of get our heads around um, the scope, like you said. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Katie and Lori, for putting this together. I know this is a huge amount of work and really very helpful um, for us trying to make these types of decisions. <laughs> no, they're not easy. No, they're not easy. Right. Okay, I think we're ready to move on. Katie and I will probably tag team this one as well. We, we work closely together. Um, so I know, and again, you know I don't have all the history with with this, um, so I've been playing catch up as, uh, as I've, I've become you know, the superintendent of the, of the district. And so, and Aaron, you and I have had a conversation about, you know, is there still an option? So what we're talking about is the, the late start Thursdays for Marshall Middle School and High School. And there's, there was a busing contract that, uh, we're busing RP that went out last spring. Um, cost came in much higher than what was anticipated because of the way that it was quoted. And you'll stop me and correct me if I get this wrong. So there was some reworking of that to 
change it from one tier or one run with five buses that, that did the, all the runs every day to two tiers, which is two runs with three buses. So that comes with a cost savings, but it also comes at a cost of service. And, you know, whether bus routes are longer, you have less flexibility, you know, so it comes with all of those pieces. But it was more cost effective for what you had budgeted for. So that was last spring, and, you know, there was some discussion, and I think we talked about this last time about, you know, having the kids continue to arrive at Marshwood Middle School and High School at the same time on Thursdays as they do on the other days, and that supervision would be provided. So we moved forward with all of that. And I know that there was some folks that, that there was some breakdowns and some communications um, around what the final decision was, and we talked about that last month. And so, the supervision is in place, the bus is running, you know, that had some impacts on, uh, for RGS as well, and Rich had to work through all of that, um, but it was there. But I, I know in conversations that there's still some, is there still an option to explore um, a later run? So I had a follow-up conversation with, I've had several, and I know Katie has as well, with the bus company. And their challenge right now is that they would love, they're, they're very thrilled that they have the staff that they have and that they have been able to meet the regular bus run needs. They are struggling with anything beyond that at this point. They, um, the staffing and the busing and the physical buses alone are, are things that would need lead time to be able to put that in place. And so in my conversation with Chris Tapp, we talked about the earliest that, that something could probably be put together would be um, the spring semester, so like late January. So, so that's a consideration. If, and I put an asterisk next to that, if they can find the staff to have, you, you've got staff that are running because you still have the other routes and you would need two buses to make this happen. So, you know, can you find two people for one day a week? That's a, that's, that's, I think it's going to be a challenge. So, it would be your, at your rate, per, your daily rate, which is, you know, $420 a day per bus. So, you know, at $840 you know, a day to do this one run, um, you know, for this one day, these two buses. So, you know, it totals out to about, for one Thursday, I've estimated it at 18 Thursdays, around $15,000. So, or actually, 15 for one, I think it was 30 for, for both buses. So, is it doable? Maybe. You know, you'd have to find, obviously, the funding, all of that. Um, the bigger concern, as I said, is just being able to staff it. And, uh, and having the, the physical buses available. So I, I, you had asked me to, to, to find out that information, so that's, that's what I was provided. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add. It's pretty much that's what it is. Um, we did talk about, you know, is this a conversation that, you know, we kind of we keep things in place for this year as they are, even though I know for some folks that's less than ideal, um, and then look to re- uh, you reopen the negotiation or you do an addendum to the contract um, and plan for it for next year so that, you know, first student can figure out how to staff it and then having the busing available that's needed. Or you may go in a different direction. I know we had some conversation about is this an option that Marshall would, like, would like to is they run their own buses. I, I don't know if that, that's another whole conversation. Uh, but that's a possibility, perhaps, to explore. So, but anyway, again, like with other things, many options to score no, no one to right, wrong direction. Um, but that's what I've learned. Well, thank you very much. That's exactly what I think we wanted to know. Um, you know, is it possible? And it sounds like it's maybe possible, mm -hmm. sort of. I would say that's right, yeah. It's an if. Um, and how much would it cost? Um, so, thirty grand for uh, one day a week for those 
those late start students is it seems like a lot. Do we have any students to talk to them about yet? Because the reality is it's cute. If, if we're talking about 50 kids, let's say, if there's that, I would think it's the seventh and the eighth and maybe the ninth graders, the ones that don't track. They probably don't mind going to school and not having class and sitting around for an hour and talking to their friends in the quiet study hall and doing work. Uh, uh, is anyone I don't think we've had any complaints. Kids don't care about that. We, and then the old, older kids are driving because they're older. No. Yeah, yeah since uh, when this whole sort of situation came to light, there was there was definitely some complaints, but I don't know that we've had any since. We haven't had. I think it was more about communication. Yeah. At the beginning, but that it wasn't communicated. I think that was the biggest complaint that they weren't aware of. <laughs> the older kids are driving, they'll take their siblings, maybe they'll take their neighbor. So that'll cut down. There's definitely some carpooling going on. That's that's what we're doing in my family. Um, you know, not everybody can do that and like you said, they have the option to go to school earlier. Um, with the bus, with the bus on the bus. bus. Right. But you know, we just we made a commitment to look into it and to I figure out, you know, what the cost would be. The stakeholders heard that I, I agree with what Shelly's saying. I mean, I, I, I just, we don't, you know, we don't have this outcry out here. There's nobody in the audience to talk to this unless somebody is here to speak to this. I think we did our due diligence and, and we moved forward. Um, it's not 30, there is an $8,000 savings though. It, it costs $8,000 for free supervision. So it wouldn't be 30, it'd be 22, but still that's a pretty high number. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Supervision. We did commit to that with Marshwood, and one of their things was if they were if you, they were going to do it for you, then we had to commit to it for the year because they had to hire staff in order yeah. to do that. So that's going to be a commitment whether or not you switch to the bus or not. We're going to have to commit to that for this year. So you're going to have that cost on top of the 30, just to make you aware of that. Okay. Thank you. So it's not a savings. <laughs> I, just, I, don't, I don't see the, I don't see the public effort. I mean, I'm not hearing anything. Yeah, unless you just decided right. to change it for next year. And Stop the margin of supervision and build it into your yeah. I haven't seen anything in my SAU104 email. I mean, we haven't seen anything. So I would, for one, would be say we look at it, and unless it comes back up, I'm good moving on. Carrie, did you have something? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify. I'm sorry. So it, it sounds like we won't. But if we did add an extra two buses, would they be running the morning run so the could attend that study hall and be supervised if that's what their parents wanted? And then run a the later bus, and that parents are going to have to shift gears again and make sure that their younger older students are supervised if they're not comfortable using them at home. Okay. And then also, is this something that we could look at again later in the year? I know we talked about adjusting the end of the RDF um, school day um, to, because this is also impacting the RDF students. It's not something we've heard complaints about, but. There are RDS students that are staying there later because their boss, um, because the buses have to come later. They did the sharing of Marshland, and I, I'm just wondering if that's a bigger conversation that might happen in other communities um, at the beginning because they're sitting in a gym at the moment. Yeah, I think that's. I think that would be a, a negotiations uh, discussion. And, and for students, open to that conversation. You know, to having. I know there was some confusion, I think, last spring. Um, and, we just, and they want to they be good partners and good neighbors, you know, in this process. So they're certainly open. Sometimes with groups, you're locked in and there's really not a lot of flexibility. But, you know, that, that's not been the case with, with yeah. our students at all. I actually meant for if we were to change the length of the school day. Oh, oh okay. Is that, is that a negotiations 
It's your oh. contract. Yeah, we, I think it we, we did talk about that briefly. Um, yeah. So we could talk about that during non-public afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. But I think that's where that that conversation has to come in. Right. Um, I'm just wondering if that's something that maybe be so re that I come up with that plan. Definitely. Yep. It feels all connected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Shelly, so have there been complaints, Mr. Hartford, about kids remaining here 10 minutes? Um, the biggest complaint is when the buses are running late, and it's not really a complaint. We get phone calls with, from concerned parents right. wondering where their kids are. Um, because we had the no. same thing with summer for three years, that our junior high kids, if anybody was here long enough, they used to have to sit because the Robinson kids <coughs> went first, so the elementary bus went first. And so this seventh, eighth, the seventh and eighth graders would, again, sit in the cab or whatever for Yeah, I think the specifics of that discussion we could have a non-public. Yeah. We do have information on that. So share that during non-public. If everyone's good with that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I think that's good on the busing. Thank you very much for looking into that and getting that data for us. That's very good to have. I will send that out one more time and, um, and I'll send that to you in a week. Yep. Send it out on the wall. Okay, keep going. <laughs> Let's keep going. Now we're up to our budget update, Katie. Yes, so the budget um, at the beginning of the year is included in your packet. We've covered all the salaries and benefits for staff, so those are set aside. Um, one thing I wanted to bring to your attention is I did receive the enrollment and the September invoice from our group for just a regular base tuition for students. I put in the packet uh, spreadsheet outlining the changes in enrollment. There's been a significant drop in enrollment. So in our budget, we anticipated 152 students. Last year in June, it was 147. Um, 
we had added a few students in for students that we knew of that were attending Marshwood where parents were paying. They were sixth graders and we're going to become seventh graders, so we anticipated that budgeted for them. Well, as of the September enrollment, I think in your packet it was 138 students, but when they sent the invoice, it was down another three. So we're down to 135 students there. So that is a decrease of 17 students based on what we budgeted. So it's a significant savings as of right now. It's about $195,000. However, with that being said, we just received the first special ed invoice the other day. Nancy's currently going through it. We always verify it to make sure that the kids are there, that our services are accurate before we encumber it. So I haven't encumbered that yet. Once we encumber that, we'll know exactly what the savings is because it, I know that there were a couple of students that we had, um, new, new special ed students. Um, some had you know, higher needs than others. So once we encumber that, we'll know for sure the, the savings. But that is a significant. I mean, the good news is going into your budget process for next year, we can maybe decrease the amount that we yeah. have going in. Um, so I'm that's in your packet to show you the differences. Um, we also received our invoices from Primax. That's our insurance company for our workers' comp insurance and our property liability. They did issue a premium holiday this year. Um, so that resulted in about $4,500 savings in that area. And then just to note, we did have we did budget for the retirement payout, about $35,000. We paid that out of last year's end of year balance. Um, you guys approved that at the end of the year, so we do have that as a savings as well. And then on the revenue side, um, as most of you know, we get money from the state, our adequacy funding from the state every year. So um, in November each year, they give us an estimate of what we're to budget for going into our budget season. And then in September, they revise that number to give us what they're actually going to give us. So. Um, since we did the estimate in November, a few things have changed. We submitted our end of year data in June for our actual students and our um, average daily membership. And then um, HB2 was a law that was passed where they took the ADM for our enrollment as well as our pre-reduced students. And they took the higher of the number between the 1920 school year and the 2021 school year due to COVID and the decreases in enrollment. So they gave us the higher of that number. Um, so that resulted in an increase of funding of about $93,000. So what happens with that is it's just going to get adjusted during the tax rate setting, and that amount is going to go back to reduce taxes. Mm -hmm. So that will happen when the tax rate gets set. So I just wanted you to be aware of that. And that's all I have. Any questions? Sorry, I did have one. I was just trying to find it. I want to start at the beginning. Shouldn't give me a microphone. Uh, no, I think it's just a typo or, yeah, so under the resident, the mission of resident students, mm -hmm. the second paragraph, it says a legal resident of a student. Should that say a legal residence of a student? What are we trying to say? I think it's supposed to be. I guess, yeah, I'm just confused by the start of that. The first, the first paragraph. Yeah, yeah, that first line in the first paragraph. Yes, residents, you're right. Yeah. Should yes. I say residents. Yep, good catch. All right, yeah, I had to read it like yeah. more than once to figure out what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Yes, it should say a legal residence of a student. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. I did read it. It's proof. <laughs> Do you have any other new short? Thank you. 
And we have, uh, under all business, we have a second reading of the BEDG policy on minutes. I motion to accept uh, BEDG as written. Back on the field trips, um, five six has been going to the river, as you know, to the Salmon Falls River, and um, Lindsay Lanzer takes a course every other year with Fishing Game, and Fishing Game provides waders and nets and tubs, and the kids go in the river, in the waders, <laughs> and collect samples. And if you go on the Fishing Game's website and look up Rollinsford. The data for the Salmon Falls River has been collected by Rollinsford students. Oh, okay. So it goes by year. So ours this year isn't currently in there yet, but from years past is in there. And again, every kid went in the river. And no one flooded waders. <laughs> Lindsay said she has never had anyone flood waders. Wow, that's awesome. So yeah, it's really, really cool because they count macroinvertebrates that they scoop up in the nets, and um, two years ago when I did it with her, two of the girls identified an invasive species plant, and when the um, woman from Fishing Game came, she verified that. Wow. So um, it was the milfoil that's been around, but um, mm -hmm. they were able to identify it, and the kids just love it. And we incorporate Rollinsford history in it with the mills and you know why our community is built on a river and you know stuff. but the kids really love it. We do math. We, the um, fishing game provide us with meters to read. So, uh, we don't do salinity to do um, turbidity, temperature, um, pH. There's several things that they measure, and the kids take measurements and then they learn how to use the meters and. That's yeah, really cool. It's a really nice trip. We went, we went down several times. So. Yeah, that's fantastic. My daughter, as you know, was involved and had so much fun. She learned so much and was yeah. excited to come home and tell us about it and tell us everything she had learned. And of course, you know, wearing the waders and using the equipment was. Really well, I have to say, this year was better than the previous year that I did it with them because that year. 
they, there was only men small. So some of the kids that were rather small to put on men small, they were like, where this year there were some kid sizes, there was like a more of a spread of sizes. So it wasn't quite so funny. <laughs> but it's, it's really, I mean, they had to count the macroinvertebrate. And then we came back, they identify it, count it, and then we came back and determined that um, the Salmon Falls River is healthy. Um, of course, we can only do the edge. You know, we can't go into the middle of the river and do testing. But for the edge, it's, it's healthy. That's it's right. not terrible. Good to know. So, yeah. Any, any other comments tonight? Yes. Celia Leopold, I have a couple of questions. One, does the outdoor, um, are there any outdoor items on the CIP to include the pavilion slash outdoor classroom that's been talked about in the past? Or the playground that is now like the slide is slung bleached in the tunnel and it's getting brittle. So, and the kids are out there a lot, just worry about breakage of that. So I'm wondering if um, any of those outdoor projects can go onto the CIP um, plan as well as indoor ones, or if they're not already on there. I'm wondering if um, any of the COVID funds could be put towards testing or providing materials for the school nurse to test to prevent learning loss. Because if she can do a test here at school, if a kid has COVID symptoms, is that feasible? Is it not feasible for our school district? Is it, should we be testing? I know some places test regularly to make sure COVID doesn't come through the door. Is that something that we could use some of the COVID funds for? And since we're in a substantial or high area right now, what is the threshold for going hybrid or remote learning? Um, in terms of outdoor stuff, we're definitely talking about that during our, our budgeting discussions coming up. Um, and I think uh, that's, that's a good question about testing and, and whether that's feasible for us. So um, we shall probably discuss that as well. Thank you. Yep. Other comments? Comments uh, by board members. to what Shelley mentioned, there, I believe there's a policy in regards to substitute pay, so you may want to, um, if you're going to review that, um, make sure that if there's dollar amounts in the policy that you bring that forward on your future agendas. Yes, thank you. Non-public tonight. We can take a look at the non-public. Four. All in favor? Second. I. Did they say what for? No. They didn't say. What are you going to non-public for? Excuse me. What's the non-public for? The negotiations. Thank, Thank you. you.